Sleep is a non-negotiable biological state required for the maintenance of human life. Much like how we need water, food, oxygen, we also need sleep. But why? What happens when we sleep? What is good sleep health? And what strategies can be employed to achieve this? Well, hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where we'll discuss all of these questions in this week's video. Why? Because it's interesting, of course, but also because many reviews came out in the journal Science last week, or the week before, on the topic, and I thought I'd share some of the interesting points from them. Now, like many in the UK, we gained an extra hour of sleep last week, and so it got me thinking, what is the purpose of sleep? Now, here's a fun definition of sleep. Sleep is a naturally recurring, reversible state of perceptual disengagement, reduced consciousness, and relative immobility, the propensity of which is patterned by homeostatic and circadian factors. There are two main phases of sleep, earlier non-rapid eye movement, non-REM, and rapid eye movement, from sleep. Besides the obvious difference between the two in terms of eye movement, if you look at the electrical patterns during these different phases, you will see different patterns of activity. This suggests that different events are occurring in these different phases. Traditionally, REM sleep is referred to the period where we dream, and non-REM sleep is for other events. In these reviews, two major events, or you could think of them as purposes of sleep, are further discussed, such as memory consolidation and waste clearance. So let's take a look at each. However, before I forget, I will just say that these events are by no means limited to the non-REM phase. It is partly that this is when they have been most studies, but could also be when these events are the strongest. So the first one, memory. Now, we had a fun definition of sleep, so here is one of memory formation. The challenging process of selecting which new experiences will be stored and integrated into an existing structure of memories that need to be simultaneously preserved and modified. This process is also more formally referred to as memory consolidation, which results in the generation of long-lasting memory traces. So when we recall the same information during wakefulness, those same memory traces are activated. An important electrical pattern thought to be important for memory that's observed in non-REM sleep are sharp wave ripple complexes, SWR, not to be confused with the Southwest Railway. They have sharp waves and ripples, as you can see here, and these can be observed in a region of the brain known as the hippocampus. In mice, if you use genetic tools to silence some of the neurons in this region of the brain, after the mice have just explored a novel environment, it's impaired their spatial memory of the environment when they were reintroduced to it. But it's most likely that it isn't just the hippocampus that's important for memory. In fact, communication between the hippocampus and the outer region of the brain, the neocortex, is also thought to be important. Now, our understanding of memory formation during sleep is still incomplete, and we may never fully understand it, but by observing the electrical patterns and from where they come from, there could be therapeutic potential down the line for transcranial stimulation to boost oscillations in non-REM sleep to maybe enhance memory consolidation. A small study showed that this was able to enhance performance in humans in a memory retrieval task, but it could be more useful for treating symptoms of neurodegenerative diseases. Now, a second purpose that's discussed in these review articles is the idea that sleep is important for waste clearance from the brain. Now, the fancy term for this whole system is known as the glymphatic system. And interestingly, it's currently thought that one of the reasons why poor sleep is associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, which is characterised by increased memory loss, is because the glymphatic system operates in a sleep-dependent fashion to clear proteins such as amyloid beta and tau from the brain, reducing the chance of building up and aggregating. And aggregates of these proteins, amyloid beta and tau, can be seen in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And so there's aggregating evidence for this too. For example, in healthy young adults, they saw increases in amyloid beta in the brain when sleep was deprived. How exactly the clearance occurs during sleep still seems uncertain. But the current model is that waste clearance via the fluid in the brain, so the interstitial fluids between cells and the cerebrospinal fluids, 
is temporally coupled to the slow neuronal waves at the stage of sleep, and also dilation and constriction of blood vessels. So as you can see in this figure, the neuronal activity occurs first, then there is a delay before there are changes in the vasculature and blood volume, and potentially somehow due to pressure changes and volume changes that they cause, this can then drive a subsequent flow of the cerebrospinal fluid that possibly contains these aggregates of proteins, helping to clear them from the brain. Anyhow, it suggests that the vasculature function is also important for being able to maintain healthy and effective sleep. But this is still an area of being heavily investigated. So how do you know if you're getting good sleep health? Well, lack of good quality sleep has been associated with many health outcomes such as poorer vascular health, metabolic health, immunologic health, mental health and cognitive health. So what are the characteristics of sleep health and then what ways can be used to try to improve sleep health? Well, one way to study sleep health, and I've now said the word health so many times now I apologise, is to use the six dimensions of sleep health. The first one of this is regularity. And so this is about keeping a consistent period and time for, from which sleep occurs. And irregular sleep schedules have been linked with diseases such as type 2 diabetes. The second dimension is satisfaction. This is a subjective measure of our own sleep satisfaction and has also been shown to be a predictive measure of health outcomes. The third dimension is alertness. Not only is this important for public and self-safety, but it also has health implications. The fourth dimension that can be used is timing. And so this refers to the idea that a portion of the events that are coordinated by our circadian rhythms occur during biological night when we're sleeping, as we've already seen with memory consolidation and waste clearance in the brain. And for those who don't know, the circadian rhythm coordinates the behavioural, physiological and metabolic processes that occur within our bodies on an around 24-hour timescale. Number five on the list is efficiency. This is an effective measure for how long does it take for you to get to sleep. In other words, a ratio between the time spent to sleep versus the time available to sleep. And this is useful to assess insomnia. And then the final, maybe the most obvious metric, is duration of sleep. The general recommendation we often hear is that we should be getting seven hours of sleep per night, but no more than nine hours. So there are evidently many ways in which we can assess our own sleep health and improvements in the ability to both better assess our sleep health and maybe down the line to improve our sleep health is the development of sleep health technology. Now, whilst technological progress has arguably probably hindered our sleep in many ways, digital media at night, artificial lighting, both of which can delay sleep onset. On the flip side, maybe there are ways that we can now use technology to better help understand our own sleep and to better research into this area in general. So firstly, there's wearables or portable sleep assessment technologies. Now, I've never done this and I think that's partly because I'm pretty content with my sleep at the moment. Or maybe as suggested in this article that one of the downsides to tracking our sleep using these wearables could result in my inferred correlation between my sleep tracker data and daytime fatigue spiralling into a perfectionist quest for ideal sleep, which could also lead to self-misdiagnosis of sleep disorders, otherwise known as orthosomnia, which wouldn't be very good. But the positives from this technology is that we can all have a better understanding of what our sleep health looks like and how much sleep we're getting. But it's important to make sure that the use of this technology is also balanced by education of the validity of these devices to assess how well they're actually working with our enthusiasm for collecting and maybe overanalyzing the data. Now, a second advantage builds on from this point, and that is, as these devices become cheaper and more accurate, they could be used to generate large data sets of sleep in many patients, which could help then lead to actionable knowledge about real-world sleep and circadian health, and ultimately help to assess the extent to which sleep is important to our health and to evaluate different interventions that are thought to help modulate sleep. So speaking about modulating sleep, there's also technology that could be used to help your sleep. Now, one that you've probably heard of are these blue blocking glasses. Yep, people do wear them. And there are also fancy mattresses that can be adjusted to improve your sleep. 
although I've actually seen very little evidence to support that they work. But anyway, in terms of the blue blocking glasses, there is more evidence for them and hope that they could be used to treat different sleep-associated disorders such as insomnia, delayed sleep phase disorder, shift work or jet lag. A recent literature study found that out of 29 experimental publications involving the use of these blue blocking glasses, 24 of which focus on sleep, there was substantial evidence that the glasses were a successful intervention for reducing sleep onset latency in patients with sleep disorders. And so the rationale was that they block blue lights, which our eye receptors are most sensitive to and which are a major input for circadian regulation. Now, I don't own these glasses and I don't wear them, but I do tend to keep my laptop continuously on nighttime mode, which helps to reduce blue light on my screen. A few other tips to improve sleep health are listed out here. It includes things you probably already know, such as the obvious, avoid caffeine and large meals before bed, try to relax and lower your body temperature before sleep, and to keep your room dark and cool, and also to get correct sunlight exposure so more in the morning than the afternoon. And this is a similar rationale to how blue light is driving the circadian rhythm, as we just saw in these blue blocking glasses. And so when you think about it, actually a lot of the fixes to ensure good sleep come down to a better understanding of our own circadian rhythm, and why disruption could be considered a hallmark of ageing, given the importance of sleep, for memory consolidation, and for waste clearance in the brain. Now, for some of us, though, we have no option but to work the night shift, or for caregiving of young or old, or due to noise light pollution of where we live. But that only emphasises the importance of research in this area, so that we can help those who are most vulnerable to sleep disruption. So, I think you probably knew at the start of the video that sleep was important, but maybe now you have a better understanding of why it's important, and some of the emerging technology that may help us to get more of it. Alright, now I'm off to bed. I'm joking, not quite yet, because I need to say thank you to my Patreon supporters and to thank you for listening.